I'm Sao Xin Liu, and uh, my co-chair is Julie Wang. Uh, we both are from the National Institute of Environmental Health Science, National Health Research Institute. It's our honor to chair this section. So I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Emmett. Dr. Emmett graduated in medicine from University of Sydney. He completed his resident training in internal medicine in Sydney, Australia, and in occupational medicine, including a fellowship in occupational dermatology at the University of Cincinnati. Dr. Emmett was a professor and the founding director of the Division of Occupational Medicine in the School of Hygiene and the Public Health and of the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health at the John Hawkins University from 1978 to 1988. Dr. Emmett returned to the Australia from 1988 to 1996, where he was the director of the Australia NIOSH and the chief executive of the National Occupational Health and Safety Commission. Currently, Dr. Emmett is a professor and the director of the academic program in occupational medicine at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine in Philadelphia. Dr. Emma has recently focused on the community affected by the environmental health hazard. He developed of the method, community first method of communication research result to such community. He has helped pioneer new way of working with the community to address problems in a rigorous scientific way. Today, he will talk about uh, using epidemiology to address community environmental health issue. Ladies and gentlemen, let's have a warm and a hearty welcome to Dr. Ahmed. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be in Taiwan and in, and in a part of the world where science is very important for the development. And I wanted to talk about technologic change, but also social change, because the world is not only changing in technology, it is changing socially. And if we think about epidemiology, epidemiology has been the science of addressing problems in specific population. But we have been one-sided. The questions that come to epidemiology generally come from the health departments, the other departments, uh, medical practitioners, professional people. And they are highly professional, highly educated. They ask particular types of questions. And that system is what we might call a paternalistic system. It is like the parent and the child, and the people about whom the epidemiologic studies are done are like the children. But the world is changing. The world is changing in different rates, different parts of the world, and different generations. The new generations are different to the old. And they are changing in that science is becoming more democratic. In fact, some people, many people in some places, now reject science. They don't, they don't know what science has to contribute. The sources of information have become decentralized. It is so easy now to get information from many different sources. In fact, we can get any type of information we want, even if it's true or not true. Uh, people want to participate and be empowered in the decisions that affect them and their family and their lives. So the public is becoming more demanding. There is more community activism. I know you have this in some places in Taiwan. And they are rejecting the paternalistic pronouncements that we have characteristically made in public health. We tell people what to do and we expect they do it. But more and more, that's not what happens. The communities want joint ownership of what is happening. And this is all enhanced 
provided new ways of communication by the use of mobile technology, the internet, social uh, media. Information and even disinformation comes from many sources. It's possible to have inaccurate alternate facts uh, and we can rapidly mobilize groups even in countries where the government does not want that to happen. And that can help or hinder the participation in scientific studies. And we have seen in society how this is changing the nature of society. Businesses now plan for what will the customer want? What will the consumer want? Uh, political leaders respond to community and business pressures. We are in environmental epidemiology in a changing social environment. So what do we do about that? One of the responses uh, that is emerging is what we call community-based participatory research. And that should be the integration of rigorous research but with people in the community. And what they help us do is define that we are ask, asking the right questions, which means the questions that are important to them. And if we can provide those results and the information, then they can take the action in their own way and do things that will make their lives and the lives of their family safer. And that is really a way of what we call research translation. It is translating the results of research into action. And I want to talk a little bit about that this today. And I want, just as Professor Marx earlier, I want to particularly draw on what I have learned from three studies. The first was as a risk communicator. The second was we set up a research centre to specifically deal with community problems. And the third was, is from communities that we studied that were affected by water pollution. So I'm going to turn about, talk about what I have learned from being in those situations. Uh, the risk communicator was an interesting position. And it was, I became the, what was called a risk communicator. I told the workers and the management the results of the research, most much epidemiologic research, but some risk safety research also, that was done on the workers in automobile factories, making cars, making trucks in the United States. And that was an interesting position because it was jointly between the union of the workers and the management. They joined together and had a research program. And it was not successful. It was not successful because what failed was getting the information back to the workforce and the management about what had been found and what should be done. And there were three problems. The first was that the format that was used, which was basically lay summaries written by epidemiologists, was incomprehensible to the management and the workers. The second was the wording was not appropriate. It was not a matter of just going to the computer and wanting, for example, the words for a sixth grade education or eighth grade education, because in some things, the people who worked in the plants knew a lot of technical and sophisticated information. They knew about processes and the names of plants and some of the chemicals they used, very sophisticated, but in other things, only very simple things. So it could not be done by a computer. And the third thing was the content. What we were sending back from science was what, not what they wanted and needed. And I will give an example from one of the lay summaries, epidemiologic study. Uh, the association between synthetic exposure, that meant a, a type of 
oil that was used in a machining operation, uh, reached statistical significance, RR equals 2, 95% CI, 1.3 to 2, 3.2 in the case control analysis based on a sample where an exposure response trend was also observed. However, with, in subjects with more than 25% of the history missing, uh, were excluded from the analysis and it didn't rise so high. Fewer than 4% of the cases had missing exposure data, but these 10 cases were all in the highest exposure category and the RR rose only to 1.3. So the worker is thinking, am I going to get prostate cancer? And actually reading that was not helpful. So we went around and, and uh, we asked the management, uh, when, and I should say, for what, there was another study presented because this was very interesting. Another study was presented and one week later from the workers came back the first 149 unanswered questions from what you have told us. The first 149 answered questions. And actually, I read through all those questions. It was very instructive to me because I just be, had to come along and, and uh, review the situation. And what the people said, what did they want to know? What they wanted to know was firstly, why did anyone do this study? Secondly, what was done? What were the results? What did the scientists, do they think it's a good study? What is going to be done about the results? How do I get more information if I need it? And how does my doctor get information about this? That was what the problems went, the, the people wanted. And once we put the information in that format, there were no more unanswered questions. It, it was a very simple response. Um, the second experience is at the University of, of Pennsylvania, and we have set up a centre that, that basically studied problems in communities at high risk. And we really took a medical, I suppose, approach. We went out and we worked with those communities as if they were patients. And just like in medicine, we learned from the communities what they wanted, what problems they had, and that what they wanted to do about it. Uh, and for one thing we've had, for example, was a waste site. I know there are many all over the world. This was a waste site of old asbestos products, 64 acres, and here you can see some people all dressed up nicely being photographed in the, uh, and you can imagine whenever the wind blows, there is a lot of asbestos fibres. And we found that we had long-term relationships with these communities, and we had a list of the questions they wanted. And the, the questions they wanted, or the issues they were interested in, could be converted into research questions. Can the asbestos, can anything be done about it in place, or must it be removed? And that led to a bioremediation project. What happens when there's flooding? Because there were flooding and storms, uh, what happens to asbestos then? It turned out very few, there was no information. So what, that became a research project. How does asbestos move in circumstances of flooding? Uh, which exposures have caused the mesothelioma, because we could easily find there was mesothelioma in the population. Was it due to the exposures in the community or was it people who used to work there? That led to an epidemiologic project and so on. Uh, how do we, re what if we've been exposed? Is there anything we can do to reduce the risk? Chemo prevention. Uh, how do we know if we're at risk? Uh, I was exposed to asbestos 20 years ago. I know it's going to be a long time before I know if I get cancer. Is there any way in the interim that I can know? That community question it became a, a biomarker project. So by identifying the 
issues in the community, we could identify the, the appropriate research. And I wondered, and we have found that to do this sort of research with communities well, there are several things that must happen. We must have mutual trust, we must understand the community, uh, and, and so on. And I will go through briefly these. Trust is very important with the community, very important politically. Trust is very easily, it, well, it is developed over a long time, it is very easily lost. What goes into trust? One thing that is very important is non-verbal communication. 60% of communication between people is non-verbal. It's not what you say, it's how you are and how you act. That is particularly important with communities. They do not understand the scientific terminology, but they can tell if you look at them in the eye, they can tell if you listen when they say things, you can tell if, they, if you acknowledge them, they can tell if you respect them and you respect their values, those things they can tell right away and immediately. And one of the things that's very important also in environmental health is who are you really working for? So communities, they will really challenge you. Who is paying for this? What have you done in the past? Because they naturally, I think we would have the same thing in a community. Is this person really looking after my interests or somebody else's. We cannot be disconcerted by that. It is very important for them to know that and it's a very good thing. We can learn the skills of working with communities. Unfortunately, in the past, I hope it's changing, in epidemiology training, there was none of this. But there are many ways. You can learn by experience. You can learn by role playing, have different people play different roles. I am a community member, here's what I think, and, and learn to do that. Very good way of learning that we have been using is videotaping things. We, have, we are, actually have made some plays that people acting, and we videotape, and you can watch, and you can watch, how do I appear to others? How do I handle it? So that can all be really learned. Uh, we need to understand the community perspective. We get, how is that best done? Ask, listen, discuss. But the very best way we have found is in-depth interviews. We don't give a survey because the survey is the questions I have thought of and I want to know. What we're trying to do is find out what is in the mind of the community. And in-depth interviews really have helped us uh, understand this. And sometimes, uh, perhaps a sociologist on the research team is, is very important. Uh, then the question, the communities do not raise questions, they raise issues, like an ambler. The issue is, can, what can we do? The research question becomes, can we bioremediate? We must do the research question. They raise the issues, and then we think, what is researchable? about this issue. It's very important also to have study designs that give clear outcomes. Uh, this is a study, I'll talk a little bit more about it at the end, but we did a study of exposure to PFOA, perfluorooctanoic acid, in a water district in Ohio. And we had an area that had both high, in the red, high air exposure, and then the other area all used the same water supply and the parts in the yellow. We didn't study the intermediate area because we wanted for the community a very clear question. Is it air exposure that causes levels? Is it water exposure or is it both? And that, a very clear question, is, is very important to communities. Communities hate to do it, here is a difference between communities and investigators. The investigator likes to do a study. Maybe it takes three or four years. 
And at the end of it, there are still some research questions. So the investigator would like to study it more, get some more funding, do more research. The community hates that. The community says, I have been, we have been involved in this study for three years, and they still don't know the result. That, it, it, it's terrible from them. So our natural inclination and the community's need, quite different. Uh, so we, we must also maintain the credibility, the way you act. We are questioning. We are not on anybody's side. We don't know what's there. We are looking to see what's there. And the medium, again, is the message. You must impartial. People can tell if you're impartial or you're biased. I think some methods are, are better than others. If you just, and uh, there was discussion of this this morning, if you do anything that they perceive can be biased, they will pick it up. Well, anyway, you have to keep connection with the community. And the last thing I want to go to, though, is communication of results. And we developed at Little Hocking what uh, you talked about, the community first communication. So this is Little Hocking, Ohio. Lovely Ohio River, like many Asian rivers. And there's the chemical plant that was using perfluoroctanoic acid. And just across the river from it, the water was drawn and sent out to Little Hocking. And we, set with the, we did a study with the community and we determined the, the objectives with the community. Is the, are the levels high? If they're high, are they coming from the water or the air? And are there any acute health effects? You can't study chronic health effects very well in this thing. Are there acute health effects? Which there weren't any, so let me say that now. We had a, a community advisory committee of people from each township, the county health commissioner, others, and we had meetings open to the public and we had them on the internet. And they told us, we asked them, what do you, what are the principles for communicating with you? And they said, okay, here they are. The first thing is that the participants in the study must receive their results before anybody else. No one, not the journalist, they don't learn about from the neighbour reading the paper, no. They must get the result first. Quite hard to do. Uh, timely information to the press, control the message, which you sort of can. Give the results promptly, but only once you're comfortable they're correct. The study must remain credible. It's our study as well as yours, must be credible maximize constructive responses if there's a problem, minimize pointless concern. That's something we don't often do. Minimize pointless concern and answer any questions promptly. And then we, and they said, here's the order people need the results. Study participants, the community, our health commissioner, our EPA, local medical, local media, and after that all the scientists and everybody else. The reverse of what we do but was incredibly important to the community. And we had some scientific things we did. Well, what did we find? We found that in the country and in our control group, the level was five part per billion. In the community, 360, the median. Almost 100 times higher, very high. In fact, in the plant, the workers in the plant were only a little bit more than the people who drank the water around. And what was worse for the community, the levels were highest in the little kids, two to four, and in the elderly. Higher in the little kids, two to four, than they were in the workers in the plant who worked directly with the material. That's the power of concentration in the water. It wasn't, the air had made no difference. And the water, if you drank mostly bottled water, uh, it was lower. And if you drank well water all over the place, because many people had their own wells, and in fact, the well water, it depended how much was in the well. If you had a well with very little water, the level, your level was low. The, highest le the lowest levels we got, well water with no, very little PFOA, the highest levels people had even higher levels than in the town water in their well. 
So it's the water. And our recommendations were consider an alternate drinking water source wherever you use uh, what, brushing the teeth, making tea, infant formula, etc. Uh, what happened? What happened was truly remarkable. The day we released the results, the company, the polluting company announced, we had no role in this, they announced free bottled water for everyone in the water district. And 79% of households adopted that. And then we did a follow-up study after 16 months of the, of the participants. And what we found, first of all, their levels of PFOA, which has a half-life of almost four years, had gone down 26%. That's almost as much as we could hope for with a half-life of four years. But more remarkable, 95%, 95% of the participants had changed their water source. We never get results like that, or very rare in public health. If we could stop 95% of the smokers or 95% of people getting up, that's, but 95% changed their water source. But what was interesting, they didn't always change their water source the way we recommended. Most people did, I must say, most people did, 88% did. But there were another group who did other solutions. We had advised them not to use water filters because they're not so efficient. Some people that had, did nothing before now used a water filter. People, and I won't go through all the things they did, but what we could see was people took that information and they made their own solutions. We call it a free market of solutions. That they didn't necessarily do did what we wanted them to do or what we thought they should do, what we told them, paternalistically told them to do, but they made their own changes according to their own circumstances. And the community was extremely pleased, particularly because we managed the, the participators first. And, and it did eventually go into a changed EPA and state drinking water standards. It, it all, and we followed the time of when they made the changes. And the time was when the study results came out. And each party, when we looked back, acted in a prudent manner. The company with the free bottled water, the people accepting the officer, offer of water or making their own solution. Uh, the government, which later, uh, much after this had happened, took this information, made standards. They all, everyone acted in a prudent manner. It was the power of the information. It was not that we had any authority or control. It was the power of the epidemiologic information. So I think that tells us this is very effective. And I would say the things about community epidemiology, it does require new skills. It requires additional steps, it, but it can be remarkably effective in changing people's action. It is not suitable for all research questions. Uh, complex questions, hard to understand, I think should not be done in this way. And really, for the community, what we need to do is ask them, what, what is it you want to know about this situation? Because if you get what you want to know, you will act on that and do the things that you have been questioning your mind and very much we must ask them how the results should be disseminated in their community. So I think this is, it's not all epidemiology, but this, I think we really have, a, Dr. Marx, Professor Marx this morning used this participation science. I, I think there really are things we need to learn because we have been very paternalistic, I think, at least in the United States, maybe not in Asia. And we have a lot to learn at this interface 
with the communities. And there is as much learning of us about the communities as there is of them from our science. But together, we will change the world. Thank you. Uh, I think most of the audience may have the experience uh, in dealing with the environmental pollution. Uh, Dr. Ahmed uh, has presented his experience in the Ohio and the proposed success fac factor. Uh, I think this model uh, not only applies in the United States, may apply to the Asia. So maybe you can express the uh, gift for the organizer. 